Hello all, and welcome to yet another lecture regarding the many fearsome, and not so fearsome, dragons of our world. Recently, we've seemed to have established a pattern of covering dragons either in the classes Delore or Mortiferum. However, today we are covering dragons that are, for the most part, safe. If the first of these creatures is much more human, as he is in fact a human, a monster morph by the name of Ethan Grinch. Grinch, as most monster morphs are known to do, kept his abilities hidden for most of his early life. However, one day, he had an embarrassing incident when he attempted to give an angel sculpture to a girl he was attracted to, named Martha of May. She accepted the gift, but this angered the son of the village's lord, who was betrothed to her, and attacked the Grinch. In self-defense, Grinch transformed into his dragon state, drawing the rage of the town to him. They warded him away from the village, and Grinch took refuge on a nearby mountain. He lived on that mountain for many years, living alone with a brown direwolf named Maximus. Years passed, and he grew old and bitter, as he began to be forgotten by the town of Below. The arrogant child, who had now been, who had now replaced his father as the town's lord, had made it illegal to even speak Grinch's name. As such, he faded into local legend. However, as it is with legends, they never truly die. A young girl by the name of Cinder Louise became interested in the legend surrounding the Grinch monster and had attempted to ne investigate herself. Many had tried to climb the mountain where the creature had lived before, but they had all mysteriously disappeared. So, one wintry day, Cinder climbed up the mountain, unafraid of the dangers that lie ahead. When she reached the top of the mountain, she was quickly found by Grinch, who surprisingly didn't kill her. Instead, he picked her up and took her down to the base of the mountain. The girl, surprised at the fact that the Grinch didn't kill her, told the entire town about what happened, though no one believed her. From that day onward, she would go up to the mountain every day to visit Ethan, and Ethan didn't feel quite so alone. In the icy mountains of the cold north, a legend is told of a ferocious creature, a creature with fur as white as the very snow it lived in, teeth as sharp as icicles, and a powerful hatred for all things to do with Christmas. This creature was known as the Abominable Snow Dragon. It was on the larger side of dragons, being about as tall as a small mountain. It would often terrorize the villages near it, eating anything in its path, but mostly feeding on reindeer. That was until a dragon keeper by the name of Yukon Cornelius, along with his ally, an oral apothecary named Hermes, were sent to rescue a dragon that had recently been captured by the Abominable. This dragon was known as the Red Rain Dragon, a crossbreed between a reindeer and a dragon, known for the glowing patterns on its body. The snow dragon saw these and had been hunting the dragon for the past few months. However, in its battle, he had finally caught it. He took down the rain dragon and dragged it back to its cave. Soon after, Yukon and Hermes arrived. After a bit of strategizing, Yukon came up with what I even admit to be a strange plan. He hid outside the creature's cave and began making pig noises. This attracted the attention of the creature, and more importantly, distracted it. Yukon then left from behind the snow dragon and bashed its head in with a rock. The creature, now unconscious, then had all of its teeth removed, disarming its prime weapon. However, after all this, it occurred to Yukon that the creature would have no way to survive in the wild without its primary offense. So, as an act of mercy, he took the creature and slowly trained it to become his own dragon partner. The Abominable Snow Dragon has been doing good work from Dragon Keepers ever since. The next dragon admittedly draws the line between safe and destructive, but I believe in competent hands it can be a source of good, as long as they follow a few rules. The Great Mogwai Dragon, as it is called, was originally found at a failing oriental shop in China, where it was kept as the owner's pet. 
We did not have an issue with this, as he had been proven to be responsible and understood the risks of his more exotic pet. However, one unfortunate day, his idiotic grandson sold the great Mogwai here to a traveling blacksmith who had taken it home to hit the American colonies and had given it to his irresponsible grandson, William. The traitorous grandson proceeded to explain the three rules of the great Mogwai to the idiotic blacksmith, but he and his family would go on to break every single one of them. The first rule was that the great Mogwai must be kept in an endlessly dark environment, as light is painful to it and sunlight is deadly. The second rule is that the creature can never interact with water, as it will cause the creature to rapidly multiply. The third and most important rule was to never feed the creature at night. This would cause the creature to rapidly transform. It would grow three times its size, its soft and fluffy fur would turn into hard green scales, and its previously mischievous demeanor would turn into a bloodthirsty wanted destruction. It is notable that some have interpreted this rule as meaning you cannot feed these creatures past the midnight hour. However, I am skeptical if this is true, as many regions of the world measure time differently, and it would always be after midnight somewhere. As mentioned, young William soon disobeyed all of these rules, and in the span of a week, his village was overrun with an army of vicious green wyverns. Fortunately, the original Great Mogwai, who was left unaffected, was more than eager to help eliminate his monstrous offspring, and together, he and William managed to eliminate the dragons. Shortly after, the shop owner, having heard what happened from his grandson, got the Great Mogwai back from William. A year later, after the shop owner's death, us dragon keepers collected the Great Mogwai, and there have been zero incidents since. Okay, there was one. The last dragon we discussed today is also the strangest. But before discussing the dragon itself, we must discuss the people who discovered it, the Alps. Alps, or elves as they are often called, are humanoid creatures that live in the northern regions of the world. Currently, they are ruled by a great wizard, Nicholas the Saint. Incidents of Alps going into human villages are rare, but do happen. During one such occasion, an Alp, only known as Father Alp, found a young orphan child named Buddyus. He found the child and took him in, raising him as one of his own and teaching him all the elk magic he could. All the while, Buddyus was convinced that he himself was also an elk, mostly because he was a less than intelligent being. Eventually though, Father Alp did tell Buddyus of his true heritage, that he was a human and son of a scribe named Walter Walters Hobbleton who lived in one of the American colonies. He had been betrothed to a woman named Susanna Wellington, who had died shortly after giving birth to Buddyus and putting him up for adoption. Buddyus immediately set off to find his long-lost father, but needed a mode of transport. And so, Father Elp taught him how to summon a dragon. Buddyus summoned a monstrous creature known throughout the Alps for its size and strength, the great Arctic Narwhal. This dragon was mostly aquatic, but could easily fly across the air. It is blue in color and has a single golden tusk that projects from its forehead, different from the common narwhal. But he has quickly rose the creature down to the New York colony. He, Walters, was, of course, in denial that this strange man, claiming to be raised by Alps and riding a ridiculous-looking dragon, was his son. However, after hearing the name of his previous lover, he soon could not deny it. The next few days were quite eventful, and frankly, I do not care to tell it, as I study dragons, not Alps. But soon, Buddyus, his new family, a female bard that he had fallen in love with, and the great Arctic Norwell, were all chased from the country by a group of four beast hunters. They all now live in the home of the Alps, happily ever after. And with that story done, a Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night.